when you think of a bioterrorist, you think of this person who's, or state, that's deliberately trying to release something. Historically, the worst bioterrorist has been nature itself. of the fatal pneumonia plague have been confirmed in China. The Zika outbreak, Ebola. The AIDS epidemic. Measles. An epidemic, either naturally caused or intentionally caused, is the most likely thing to cause, say, 10 million excess deaths. We're not yet close to where we need to be to be prepared for the next epidemic. We have only two modes, complacency and panic. That's how former Energy Secretary Jim Schlesinger in 1977 described America's approach to energy. But that same dig could be applied to a variety of U.S. policies today, especially with how we handle the world's biggest killers. Hello and welcome to G-Zero World. I'm Ian Bremmer, you knew that. And today, I'm looking at the politics of pandemics, why it's a matter of when, not if, and how social trends and repeated policy failures have made us all a little unsafe. To help me examine why is one of the world's preeminent scientists on pandemics. He's a man who spent his career fighting HIV, AIDS, and other emerging infectious diseases. I'm talking about Dr. Anthony Fauci. Next, remember this guy? Dr. Craig Spencer, when he returned back here to the United States, he was monitoring his own potential symptoms for Ebola. Five years later, we caught up with him to ask, what's up, Doc? Don't worry, I've also got your puppet regime. But first, a word from the folks who help us keep the lights on. In October 1982, a pesky journalist named Lester Kinsolving took his seat in the Reagan White House briefing room. A string of deaths had been recently reported by the Centers of Disease Control, attributed to a new disease called Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, or AIDS. Lester couldn't have known then that AIDS would eventually take the lives of 25 million people worldwide, but he did know something was wrong. White House spokesman Larry Speaks, of course that was White House spokesman's name, fielded his questions. Have a listen. Does the president have any reaction to the announcement of the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta that AIDS is now an epidemic in 600, over 600 cases? Yeah, so over a third of them are done. It's known as gay plague. <laughs> no, it is. I mean, it's a pretty serious thing that uh, one in every three people that get this have died, and I wonder if the president is aware of it. I don't have it. Are you? Do you? You don't have it. Well, I'm relieved to hear that. Larry. I, do you? Oh, you, didn't, you didn't answer my question. Well, wondered, How do you know? Does the president, in other words, the White House looks on this as a great joke. By the end of 1984, scientists had concluded that AIDS was the product of human immunodeficiency virus, or HIV. And by then, nearly 300,000 people had been infected. Yet President Ronald Reagan hadn't mentioned the disease publicly at that time. So in December of that year, Lester pressed the White House again with more questions. An estimated 300,000 people have been exposed to AIDS. <laughs> is the president concerned about this subject, Larry? No, but I mean, is he going to do anything, Larry? Lester, I have not heard him express anything. I'm sorry. He has no, uh, no, expressed no opinion about this epidemic? No, but I must confess I haven't asked him about it. Would you ask him, Larry? Another three years passed before President Reagan would deliver his first major speech on AIDS, and by then, more than half a million people had been infected. It was a major public health crisis, which even today still kills hundreds of thousands worldwide. So why did it take so long to address? The reasons have as much to do with culture as they do with preparedness. The stigma of intravenous drug use and even bigotry, you heard them laugh when Lester called it gay plague, all kneecapped America's response. These days, the challenges facing pandemics have evolved. As new diseases spread, so does fake news. Remember those anti-vaxxers who claim vaccinations were linked to autism? They're still out there, and they're fanning social media flames and sowing distrust of health officials. And priorities shift. It usually takes a crisis to readjust focus. If you look at Ebola, back in 2014, Congress approved a $5.4 billion emergency package to fight the virus in West Africa. The idea was to get to the source, 
which is usually cheaper and much more effective than fighting the virus once it's spread. And it was. The move helped limit the death toll to under 20,000 people compared to the hundreds of thousands that experts predicted. But that doesn't mean Ebola is gone. The World Health Organization recently declared an international emergency in the Democratic Republic of Congo, the second largest Ebola outbreak on record, more than 3,000 cases, 2,000 deaths. Also accused Tanzania of covering up a new suspected outbreak. Meanwhile, over here, Americans are covered, right? I mean, after all, the president of the United States is an avowed germaphobe. I'm also very much of a germaphobe, by the way. But the top White House official in charge of pandemic preparedness has left the job. That means there is no longer a senior administration official focused squarely on global health security. His unit was also disbanded. Sit with that for a moment before considering this. An outbreak can spread to any country on Earth in less than 36 hours. It's a flight or two away. A successful response demands coordination with multiple partners across multiple regions. It's a rapid assembly line that includes medical boots on the ground, local community groups, media campaigns, swarms of epidemiologists, that's what we officially call them, swarms, GPS systems to track potential cases, stockpiles of medicines and vaccines, and an effective distribution mechanism. In other words, pretty much the opposite of this. He has no, uh, no, expressed no opinion about this epidemic. No, but I must confess I haven't asked him about it. What choice do you have? Yeah, I know. You know, we're stuck with you. <laughs> what you see is what you get. It's fine. Dr. Anthony Fauci. Hi. Very good to be with you. Thank good you. Good to much. be with you. So, I mean, if we're talking about pandemics. I, I saw a contagion. Yeah. Um, it felt like we really weren't ready. Um, right. it, are we really not ready? You know, it really depends on how you how you define a pandemic and the extent of the pandemic, the mortality associated with the pandemic, um, and 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 your ability to respond. If you have the most outrageous, cataclysmic pandemic no amount of preparation is gonna make you go through that relatively unscathed. There's gonna be a lot of morbidity and mortality. But when you look about pandemics, there's different degrees of pandemics. For example, in 2009, we had what would be technically classified as a pandemic. We had an H1N1 so-called swine flu. Mm -hmm. And if you go by the definition of pandemic, is something that is an outbreak that's pan throughout the world, hence the word pandemic. It is new in that there's very little background immunity because we get outbreaks, for example, of influenza like clockwork every season. Every year. Mm -hmm. The reason it isn't a catastrophe every season is that there's a lot of background immunity. Uh, you get vaccinated each year. Influenza, unlike almost any other virus, continues to drift or mutate so that it doesn't stay stable the way measles does. So the measles that I happened to get when I was a child is not very different at all from the measles decades later that circulate so that you get vaccinated against. I mean, I just saw in California, we have the first billboard that they've put out, anti-vaxxer. Right. How much has that mattered to you? It matters a lot. It, it really does. I mean, if you look historically in medicine, one of the most important and effective ways to prevent disease, suffering, and deaths through infections is by vaccinations. Clearly, the track record of vaccinations is that they are safe. Now, one of the things that you have to deal with in biology is that any intervention is never 100% without a side effect. But if you balance the protective impact of vaccines versus the rare, rare, uh, side effect that's serious. It's overwhelming to get vaccinated. Uh, there are people uh, who are driven in the anti-vax philosophy by lack of information or by absolutely false information. The most egregious of the false information is the issue of the association of the measles, particularly measles, mumps, rubella, and autism. Mm -hmm. So it's misinformation is one thing. The other thing is that we are almost the victims of our own success. Now, particularly in a country like the United States, a developed country in which there is very little, if any, of these childhood diseases, at least in an outbreak fashion, there's this 
Complacency. Feeling, well, yeah. it's, it, it's complacency, but it also is what I refer to as libertarianism taken to the extreme, mm -hmm. where they feel they don't want any authority, civil or medical, to tell them what they are gonna do with their children or with their family. But one of the things that escapes people is that when you're talking about vaccination for, for diseases with outbreak potential, you obviously have a responsibility to protect your own child, but you also have a responsibility to society because there are people in society, in the community, who for one reason or other can't get vaccinated. Now you haven't mentioned Ebola. Right. Once, um, despite we're, we're now in the second largest outbreak that we've right. seen, right. Um, and certainly um, in the region, uh, DRC and the like, there's an awful lot of economic devastation right. as a consequence. Is um, what, what's why shouldn't we be as yeah. focused on that? Well, there will not be a massive outbreak of Ebola in the United States. There won't be by the very nature of how it spread. Ebola is spread by direct contact with the infected body fluids, and that's blood, that's mucus, that's urine, that's feces, that's vomit. When someone gets really sick with Ebola, they are generally incapacitated, they're in bed, and that's the reason why the people who get infected are the family members who don't know and don't have the capability of taking care of them, so they get exposed. People who take care of the body after the person mm -hmm. dies, healthcare workers who are not properly protected with personal protective equipment. It isn't spread casually. And the reason you take Ebola as a very serious, scary disease, because once you get Ebola, it's a really serious disease with a high mortality. Luckily, we have treatments for it now, which we've developed, but without treatment, the mortality is very high. And the media at the time, right, right in the United States, oh, goodness. I spent was out of control. Well, I spent a considerable amount of my time on television trying to add a degree of calmness to the fact of what are the facts about Ebola, how is it spread, and how is it not spread. And the threshold for panic and rumor spreading in the country is extraordinary. So let me give you a tough one. Yeah. Uh, bioengineering. Um, the ability of state actors, right. terrorist actors, right. to actually weaponize um, influenza or other uh, bioweapons right. to impact populations. We've heard a lot about this. Right. Are we close to having um, bad actors outside of governments that would have the capacity to develop those? When you think of a bioterrorist, you think of this person who's or state that's deliberately trying to release something. Historically, the worst bioterrorist has been nature itself. So when you prepare as we are for the natural occurrence of a pandemic flu or antimicrobial resistance, the things we work on every day, it's a natural transition into the same type of preparation against something that would be deliberately engineered to be spread. So is it possible that that could happen? Yes. Are we aware of it? Yes. Do we prepare for it? Yes. We prepare every single day for it with the same type mm -hmm. of tools that we prepare for a natural evolution. If you look at the, the diseases globally that have the greatest impact that we should really target, and we are targeting them, and obviously more resources would make it easier to target. Malaria with the devastating effect, particularly among African babies, but malaria throughout other parts of the world. Tuberculosis, an ancient disease that we tend to forget about, but it's the leading cause of infectious disease death throughout the world, 1.6, 1.8 million deaths per year. So you have malaria, tuberculosis, HIV. These are things that are there. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that I aspirationally hope to be able to encounter is the ability to rapidly respond to something brand new, whether it's a brand new pandemic or, as you mentioned, a brand new attack upon us deliberately by bioterror. Dr. Anthony Fauci, don't panic, get your flu shot. <laughs> is that fair? You bet, and I already have. Very good. <laughs> yeah.
My name is Craig Spencer. I'm a doctor. I work in emergency medicine. Dr. Craig Spencer became the first and only confirmed case of Ebola in New York City back in 2014. He contracted the virus while volunteering for Doctors Without Borders in West Africa. And the news caused a panic as health officials searched for anyone who might have come into contact with him. At a bowling alley, he was actually bowling with Ebola, spelled differently, on the subway and in his neighborhood. In the end, there were no other cases and Craig recovered, but the experience was traumatic nonetheless. Seeing so many people die of this horrible virus, seeing the toll that it can have on the human body, um, it's impossible to describe the, really the mental exhaustion. So in 2014, when I was in Guinea, I was there in September, October, when the case numbers were really, really going up. That's when you started hearing about patients at the doors of treatment centers that weren't able to get in. Um, our days were 12 to 14 hour days. Take care of as many patients as we can. Try to teach other patients to help other people when we weren't able to be inside. Generally, you'd walk out through this whole process of being decontaminated. You'd pour out your boots and there'd be a liter of water really, really dehydrated, um, really, really exhausted. At the end of the day, all you want to do is relax, maybe have a beer, have something to eat and go to bed, and then start it all again the next day. When I found out that I was infected, it was actually here in New York City. Being hospitalized for 19 days, um, at the time felt like forever and now seems like a blur. Um, I had a really amazing medical treatment uh, plan. I had a really great team that took care of me. But the thing that I constantly kept thinking back on was that Whereas in the hospital I was taken care of, there were maybe 30 doctors always on call for me. In Guinea, when I was taking care of patients, I was maybe taking care of 30 patients myself. So I wasn't on social media at that time. I had closed all my accounts. I made a kind of an intentional uh, decision not to follow what was going on in the media. Um, I didn't know anything about Trump's tweet at that time. Um, it's not anyone that I, I followed. Um, it's a bit heartening to know that we've disagreed on nearly everything for at least the past five years. Personally, my experience has really been focused on highlighting the importance of public health. Um, I was working on a search and rescue boat in the Mediterranean in 2017 and 2018. These are people, these are humans just like us. We need to do what we can to provide them with the services. And it may be healthcare, it may be pulling them from a rickety plastic boat in the middle of the sea. Um, it may just be respecting their humanity. And I saw an inequality in that approach, both in West Africa as well as in the Mediterranean. We didn't really learn a lot from the last time. We didn't learn a lot from 2014 in the West Africa Ebola outbreak. We are seeing a very similar response in DR Congo now that we saw in West Africa a couple years ago. We're seeing almost the same mortality despite the fact that we have a vaccine that's known to be almost perfectly effective. So this should be concerning for how we respond to pandemics or uh, viruses or bacteria with pandemic potential. You can't build a moat wide enough or a wall tall enough to keep out pandemic threats. It's gonna happen. Should there be a disease that starts in China or Columbus or wherever it may be, it can be anywhere else in the world within a day or two. We are interconnected. There needs to be um, strong reporting systems with you know, strong incentives and a, and a good response mechanism. Otherwise, we're just leaving ourselves vulnerable to the next pandemic. And now for something completely different, I've got your puppet regime. Thanksgiving, the day when we remember the thousand year friendship between the United States and the pilgrims. But most of all, the day that we spend with the ones we love the most. Knock, knock. knock. Who's there? Mm -hmm. Oh, Vlad, Kim, Mo, you guys made it. We sure did. And it's time for the four of us to have a very special Friendsgiving! And we are going to cook up a storm, right guys? Yeah, of course, uh -huh. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we made an awful mess, but I'm proud of what we have done here today. And now all that's left to do is decide who gets to carve the turkey. Oh, I want to carve up turkey. Not as much as I want to carve up turkey. Guys, guys, calm down. I really don't care what happens to turkey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah! That's our show this week. Come back next week. Don't miss it, because if you miss it, it's as if there's no show. I really require an audience to keep doing this. But in the meantime, if you like what you've seen, and I hope you have, do check us out at g0media.com.